pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. In that, in that particular phrase, it's got a lot of things that I've highlighted here that we could, in, in 9 and 10, that we can talk about. Uh, knowledge of his will in all wisdom. It talks about spiritual understanding, understanding spiritual things. And it talks about you might want to walk worthy. And that, all this takes looking at ourselves. Am, am I walking worthy? And do I have spiritual understanding? And do I have wisdom? in what I'm reading and what I'm telling others that I do and how I'm living my life. And then it also says, be fruitful, being fruitful. And that's something that we, an action that we actually have to take and we actually have to do. We can't just come in and say, oh, that was great and go about our business without doing something to be fruitful, no matter how small that may be. And increasing in the knowledge of God. So but, you know, just those two passages, we have uh, everything pretty much we need to do moving forward in the future. And the big thing is increasing in knowledge of God. I got a statement that I wrote, it's easier to do what is right when we know what is right. So first you have to know what is right before you can do it. And how do we know what is right? Well, we have to check with the creator of the entire universe what, what is right, okay? Because we have lots of things we can look at. We have the laws, and we have this and that, and several things. Uh, arguments out in the world about what is right and wrong, but basically it all comes from one little book. And if you want to just take the, the, the New Testament, which is a little book about this big in most Bibles, then that's pretty much all the instructions and the rest of it is how we got there. So that's what we need to do. And all this is done, uh, all that is done in life is done better if we have a good attitude. And that's where, this is where the attitude comes in. Everybody here has dealt with salespeople. If you go to the electronics store, you go to the car store, you got some guy moping around, yeah, I can help you. Yeah, I had trouble yesterday. And, you know, and they start talking about what a terrible day they had or the waitress comes up to you and says, yeah, can I help you? Boy, I've had a hard day. And you're like, oh, what a bad attitude. This is not going to be good. We all recognize those little situations instantly that, man, if this person has a bad attitude, I want to stay away. So if our attitude, in some small way, religiously, or in, in, in regard to the Bible, is that kind of a, you know, don't talk to me, I've got problems, uh, we can see the difference, then other people can see the difference. So that's our first kind of an idea, is really attitude is everything when it comes to just when you meet somebody for the first time, or whatever you're doing in the, in the realm of, of God and Jesus Christ and religion. In Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So everything comes out of the heart. So your attitude is part of that heart. So you need to check yourself and see what's coming out and what issues are coming out in your life. I mean, I, if you have a bad day and all that sort of thing, then that's when you turn to God. That's when if you don't know when to pray, you just pray at that time. I'm having a hard time. It can be a simple little thing. It can be a, a first world problem. My uh, Coke machine in the basement quit working. Unbelievable. Now I've got to take the stuff out of my refrigerator in the garage and move it into the house. Unbelievable, right? That can be a first world problem, and you can still turn to God and say, listen, I know this is stupid, but help me to come back, come back, okay? I know it sounds weird, but... Those little things in a, in a life like most of ours is the things that bother us the most. And then they carry on in our day and make our attitude bad. It doesn't sound like it should, but that's what we, where we have to check. That's where I have to check myself on how is my attitude and what's causing it to be bad. could be as simple and silly as something like that. So proper attitudes are needed in order to have the right relationship with God and, of course, the local church because you're going to be carrying all of your baggage in. And that's what we need to, also, we all know that we need to be here to edify each other and build each other up. And, you, and that starts with it. Just a simple little, hey, how are you? 
Okay, in Romans 12, 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's a very uh, strong statement. And that's not so easy to do, not to think highly of yourself. Because that, that kind of stuff goes on all the time. But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So there again, he's telling us in Romans here to check yourself. Don't think too highly of yourself when you're out and about and you see somebody that obviously you are a station above. I mean, that happens. You see people like that. It, whether it be dress, car, manner, language, all the realms of putting yourself above, then you need to check yourself. Okay, I, 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 I am not too, too great that I, can't be, that I can't be tempted or fall. That's the first attitude. And the attitude toward God we must have. In uh, Matthew twenty-two thirty-four, 34, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, that thou love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. So this lower station person, and wherever it is and however it, it comes about in your mind, pops into your mind, that's what he's talking about here. Love your neighbor as thyself, and everything hangs on that. Strangers, and it, we'll talk a little bit about strangers a little later, how to treat strangers, and that's a big part of it. And also, we're going to be talking about how to treat each other in, in, the, in God's in the church, God's family. We, uh, if we love God with this type of strength, all of, uh, where is it? All of thy soul, thy mind, thy heart. That's a lot. That's, <laughs> that's pretty much everything. So that's, that's not the easiest thing to do. We can begin to have the right attitude if we put that in our mind. Okay, I have to love God with everything. Then I have to turn toward others. And, and those of the world and those here in the church. Just kind of put it in order. Another uh, attitude that we have to have in order to please God is faith in Him, of course, and trust in what He tells us, the promises, in other words. What, he, what promises He gives us as a, as a group of human beings, as individuals, and in the church, and in our life, and what, what He'll do. In Hebrews 11.1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And that's an important statement. Hopefully everybody's heard that. And Hebrews 11:6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we talked a little bit this morning about our responsibilities of uh, actually doing something. You know, seeking him. You have to open the book. You have to question yourself. You have to think not highly of yourself. Start putting these attitudes in there. Looking out after others. When you, when you have a, a thought where you're like, hmm, uh, who's that guy? And say, okay, maybe I better check myself. Because somebody could be looking down on me for whatever reason. And uh, a personal note, it happens to me because I don't always wear a suit. I wear filthy clothes. I crawl around in gutters and up in attics and down in crawl spaces. I come out, I, you know, I'm out and about in the community and I get, you know, come on kids, walk over here, you know. <laughs> Mud on me, grease, you know. I'm like, haven't shaven in four days. So I know what that's like. You, I get those looks a lot. <clears throat> and I usually go on Wednesday nights to church that way. So I can, I'm on the other end of that when people move and say, can I help you when you walk into a store? First thing. Can I help you find something? I'm going, I just got through the door. Just, I, I'm in here because I know what I'm looking for, if you want to tell me where it is. So I get those sort of things. And that's why I, I, it's fresh in my mind. We must, uh, in, it, it, according to God's uh, words here, 
we must believe the promises that promises that God has made us and trust that he will deliver us the way he says he will. And the only way to do that, once again, is to actually, what is he promising me? What is this all about, this whole Christian thing? If you tell somebody, you know, you should be a Christian, it's a great way to live, and they're like, well, what, why? What's it all about? So we have to know what the promises are so we can tell others. You know what? God promises this. Jesus promises us this and this and this. And then when they say, well, what about, what always comes up when you do this is, what about this? I have this trouble. I have a broken down car. I can't find a job. And then you have to have the answer for that. And of course, it's in the Bible. Everything that pertains to life and godliness is found on these pages. So then you have to discover, well, how can I tell this person that's having a hard time that there's a, that it'll get better, maybe not physically in this realm, but there's a better, better life outside of all this trouble. And it's going to continue and make them feel good about that. It's a big, that's a stiff order. The next thing we have to do is have after faith and trust and after uh, understanding, uh, having that love for God and others, is uh, the third and final thing under attitudes we need for God is uh, thankfulness. And that's a, that's a tough one sometimes when you have everything. You know, to be thankful, because you, you, if you have everything, then you, of course you want more. So if you get this, then you want a little bit more. You strive. I mean, that's natural, and we're supposed to. We're not supposed to sit around on our hands, because we're, we're told to work. If you want to eat, you got to work. And that's the way it works. But in Ephesians 5.20, it says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God. And the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to give thanks to God always, he tells us, in, 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 in his name. In Colossians 3.17, and whatsoever we do in the word or deed, so that's pretty much everything. Everything we do in word and deed, if you do something or say something, and here's what you need to do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. That's another stiff order, but it tells us that that's what we need to do. So we must be truly thankful to even have the basic needs that, we, that, that, are, that are met in our lives. And if we do that, then uh, we'll be moving forward in the faith and the trust in God that we need. The next thing, the attitudes that we have to have, is uh, attitudes toward ourselves. So now we need to look inward just a little bit. And the first thing, of course, that always comes up when you're told to look into yourself, at least in biblical terms, is uh, humility. Because we know that's what Christ did. He came here to serve. He didn't come to conquer or and rule or hold anything above people. He washed the, uh, the uh, feet of the apostles. He you know, did all the low things, hung out with low people and, and all the rest of it. And that's the humility that we must have. We can still have a good life. We can still live in a nice place and have these things and still be humble. We can still be proud of the things that we've done, the accomplishments we've made with God's help and be thankful for that and still have humility. It is possible. And the Bible tells us how we can do that. In Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. So take yourself down a peg. Don't be too wise in your own things. Listen to others. And this helps you be, uh, gives you that little bit of humility that we're looking for. We must be able to lower ourselves, of course, as Christ lowered himself and serve others. So that's, that's a very important thing. And uh, I, I mentioned a little bit about it earlier about how people look down on other people. But I have a, uh, so when you're doing things for others, um, it always comes up, well, well, you know, maybe, well, the guy with the cardboard sign, you know, well, I don't want to give him money because what's he going to do with it, right? Or, you know, that's, okay, that is giving to others and doing for others. That's easy to find. They're like on corners all over the place in the city. But the main thing I found, I have a service job where I go into people's homes. I go into uh, 300 to 350, 400 homes a year. And I would say 
there's only about one out of ten of those people that I, homes that I go into in a week. So one person a week, if I go into ten homes, will actually offer me water, whether it's summer, winter, whatever. Well, this is kind of weird. You'd think that everybody could give away water. It's free practically, right? Psh, here you go. I'm going to take it right out of the sink. I mean, I spend three hours with them, three to three and a half hours every day with each, each family or a person, whatever it is. And that nine out of ten times, they won't offer me a drink of water, let alone anything else. And then well, about five times a year, somebody will give me food and something to drink. The rest of the time, I'm like huddling, huddling around, drinking out of the faucet in the bathroom in the basement. Oh. Come out of an attic, and this guy's standing there with a... Uh, uh, so he says, it's so hot. I don't know how you can stand it. I'm wet from here to here with sweat because I've been in the attic for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 120 degrees. I'm like, yeah, I ran out of water. He goes, oh, wow. He opens his fridge. He takes out a Gatorade. Oh, I got to go in. He goes in. I said, well, oh, I'll be right back. I got to go get something at the store. He goes, I'll be here. I mean, the refrigerator is falling over with drinks. I'm not kidding. So that is something that we can do when you, when you do for others. I mean, it's a simple thing. I mean, the Bible even talks about if you give somebody a drink in my name, if you don't, then, you know, you're hurting me just like you hurt them by not doing it. I mean, that's a silly thing, but I see it just about every day, every week. And the funny thing is, the ones I remember the most that actually sat me down and cooked me food were uh, foreigners. There was an Indian couple and a Chinese they seem to be like, hey, who eat, 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 you know? Come, sit, please. You sit, please. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you want again? Yeah, bring it on. What is that stuff? And it was, what was that stuff he, they fed me? It was an Indian company. It was so good. It was uh, gourds, right? Those ugly things you see sit on your porch to rot. That's what they were feeding me. It was awesome. I didn't know you could eat that stuff. I thought it was just decorative junk you put on your porch in the fall. Anyways, did I say all that because uh, we must be able to lower ourselves as Christ did and offer somebody something as simple as that. You see a group of people working out in front of your house doing those trenchings where they do the cable and they work out all day. Just go out and throw some water, soda, get stuff out of your fridge in your garage and give, up, give some excess away. Something as, sens- uh, as simple as that can, can help others. And, it's, and the next thing we need to know as an attitude toward ourselves is to have a little teachability. We have to be able to be taught. Uh, no matter how long we've been doing it, how long we've been sitting here or hearing or how new we are, that seems to be a little easier. But when you've been doing it a while, you know, you've been coming to church, you've been believing and you, you're doing the steps and so forth, then teachability is, is a little bit more difficult. And when you come into a situation where you have elders and deacons, then there's a lot more dynamics involved when you're used to just all meeting together and deciding. So that's another thing that we need to try to put in our mind. In Proverbs 15.31, The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. But he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. So all that being said, um, if you take wisdom, the, and, and that's where honor and humility comes in, comes in. So when we are wrong in what we teach, or uh, we must be able to take correction to learn from our mistakes. That's the big thing you want to take away from that. And we're not going to know unless somebody corrects us, whether it be the word or, or somebody in the group. Hey, you better want to watch out about this. Or I've seen what you did or in your own family. We need an eagerness to learn and to grow. In uh, 2 Peter 3.18, it says, But grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So we must say, I want to learn. I want to grow. We must have this desire in us if we are going to be pleasing to God. Then the last thing is attitudes toward the brethren that we must have. 
course, what's the first thing? The greatest thing we talked about, the very first passage, of course, is love. And that's also rendered charity. So that little charity of water, you know, come on in, have a soda, have some food, is, is part of it. Charity is rendered love also. Kind of goes back and forth. So that little bit of helping others is very important. In 1 Peter 2.17, it says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Well, that tells you every aspect of life. Honor all men, that's everybody, whether you like them or not, or whether they're so a worker bee, or, or it says right here, honor the king. So you, and it doesn't say you have to like the king. So your boss, you don't have to like him, but you do have to honor him. You don't like the president, you don't have to like the congressman or whatever, or whoever they are, but you do honor them and you give them that honor. So having that humility, the honesty, the, the teachability, all those things kind of work in this thing called love. And then John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So obviously that is the most important command. You love one another because he loved us, and then all, all men know that you're his disciple because of the way you treat other people or each other. It gets very difficult when you're trying to pick elders and pick uh, deacons and you're trying to change the, the format, so to speak, of how everybody's going to interact with each other. It gets very scary. I've been in congregations that didn't have them for many years and then they did have for many years and then ones that tried to get them and then it, it, all these things crop up. So all these types of attitudes are, are going to be needed because everybody's got ideas. And then sometimes everybody's ideas don't work, and you have to work through it. We are given a direct command in, in this particular set of passages. A new command I give unto you, ye love one another. So there you go. The next thing we have to have is uh, cooperation and working together. That, you know, sounds easy. In first. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 21. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. So that goes about just about everything we're talking about, about humility and others, people's stations, and who's been here longer, and all the rest of that sort of thing. So cooperation and working together is very important. Not always easy. The next thing would be uh, that, that we must have, attitude that we must have, is appreciation for others and the work they do. That's sometimes overlooked a lot. Who cleans the building? Who's the one in charge of, you know, vacuuming or unlocking or turning on the fans or turning on the heat or the boiler, straightening out the rooms downstairs, all this stuff. It's I come in, it's magically done every time I come to visit. Everything's ready to go. I'm like, huh, come in? Great, okay, thanks. But somebody has to do that. And we just have to remember that there are people doing those things. And the bigger you get and the more people that start flooding in here because you guys have something special, uh, it's, it's going to have to be done and we're going to have to appreciate the people that may or may not have been doing it all along. And it doesn't have to be a announcement up here. Uh, Bob does all this work. Let's give him a hand. It's just is on your own, in your mind, and all that sort of thing. So we must tell others how much they are appreciated. That's the number one thing. Everybody really wants to be appreciated, and most people at work don't feel appreciated, so everybody knows what that's like. There you go. True appreciation will eliminate destructive criticism, gossip, and factions. True appreciation. That's all you got to do. In Philippians 2.1, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, 
let each esteem other better than themselves. That's pretty, pretty sweet right there. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not to every man on, on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Beautiful. That's all we got to do. Isn't that simple? Not easy, but it's very simple. And then uh, the last thing is going to be peaceableness. And that can be found in Romans uh, 14 and 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. And the things wherewith one may edify another. That's what we talked about earlier. Edifying, building everybody up. And then Ephesians 4.3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And another one in Matthew 5.9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So you've got, in uh, summing everything up, We have to love one another, and then we have to have forgiveness, forbearance, patience, peaceableness, appreciation for the work that's done, warm and friendliness, very important. Just to recap, cooperation, working together, and then, of course, the number one thing is love. And be kind to one another. And that's uh, everything I have for tonight. The attitudes that make for an ideal working conditions among members of the body of Christ. Because as you know, we do, uh, when, we, when we are a group of uh, local, uh, local people, we agree to work and worship with each other, and we decide what that work and worship is. So that's the, that's the challenge ahead of you. In Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which also is in Jesus Christ. So he had the mind first, and he just tells us that you need to think like I do. If you do that, everything will work out perfectly. Everybody will have a great attitude, and we'll just move right along. So if there's uh, anyone here that needs to have the uh, prayers of the saints, that needs to uh, be baptized, they can do that tonight. If you have any needs at all, please come forward as we stand and sing number eight. 35. <laughs>